who thinks so here we go Greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, Robert Meyer Burnett. I invite you to watch and listen to the Designing Hollywood podcast, brought to you by Martika Abera and the great, legendary Hollywood costume designer, Marilyn Vance. I am afforded the wonderful opportunity of co-hosting the show. If you are interested in the magic of Hollywood, the design of Hollywood, the clothes of Hollywood, watch the Designing Hollywood Podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts from or find the video version on YouTube. That's right, the Designing Hollywood Podcast. Why would you ever want to miss it, especially if you love the movies? Observations with Robert Meyer Burnett. Well, greetings, Imagination Connoisseurs. Once again, it is I, your Duke of Dope Discourse, your Master of Fun and Wonder, your Viceroy of Verisimilitude, your, you know, all the names that everybody hangs on me. Of course, your existential Mr. Rogers. That's right, Robert Meyer Burnett. And this is Rob Observations, episode number 806. And today, my friends, today is Star Trek Day. Today, 56 years ago, The Man Trap was first broadcast on American television changing everyone's lives and of course it, it it's amazing now i kind of wanted to do something special for star trek day and i figured you know we do the inglorious trek spurts and everything but but there's a gentleman i've known for a long time who i admire greatly he is an academy award-winning makeup artist he won for dick tracy he is a literally a li- well he was alive when star trek came on the air but he's been a fan of star trek since it first aired he, he, he's a, a fan turned professional. He's worked at the highest levels of Hollywood and he has also worked on Star Trek. He worked on the four Next Generation movies. He worked on Next Generation itself. He worked on Deep Space Nine. He worked on Voyager. He worked on Enterprise. He even designed, a lot of people talk about this, but he even designed the NX-01 refit. And here it is. You've, it, it never appeared. It never appeared on Enterprise, but now it's now it's uh, oh, now he's telling me it's his least favorite view, and that's and that's Mr. Doug Drexler. So I've got Doug Drexler. Doug, welcome to Rob Observations. It's great to have you. Now, you know what? I I gotta tell you. I gotta tell you. There's been a lot of controversy online. I've been blowing uh blowing a lot of smoke out about how I'm a huge fan of Star Trek Picard season three and and uh while i got off on the wrong foot with this gentleman uh i have to say that i've been talking about him we, we got to meet uh i said something snarky and he said on twitter that he really liked my movie free enterprise and i wrote back to him because i couldn't stand star trek card season two i said but i love 12 monkeys which is a show <laughs> that he he show ran now i other than twitter i had never met this man until I recognized him last weekend, last Sunday, actually. He was buying merch for his son at the John Williams concert uh, at the Hollywood Bowl. And ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, my new best friend, Star Trek Picard Season 3 showrunner, Mr. Terry Metallus. Terry, welcome to Rob Observations. I mean, two guys, you guys both worked on Star Trek back. You worked on Enterprise. Yeah. Uh, Doug, you were in the yeah. art department. Yeah. Terry, you were a writer's yeah. assistant. You were Brad and Brog's assistant. You know, yeah. And the art department was the cool place to visit. You know? It was. That's where That's where you would go to hang out, was the art we, department. We had fun. We were laughing all the time up there. Yeah. We had nutty yeah, people. Does. John Eves was crazy. You know? John Eves <laughs> and his soundtracks. We would play Jerry Goldsmith yeah. nonstop. And Jim the Van Over. You know. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a nexus of Star Trek delight. Oh, I see what you did there, but was it an echo, or was it the actual nexus? I mean, come it on, was the it, it was Guinan in that nexus. But but, but I didn't but see him. Doug, is, Doug has also worked on season three of Picard. It was very important that we bring 
dug back on. In fact, the ship you saw today in that in that uh, teaser, I don't want to call it a trailer because it's not a trailer. A lot of a lot of Doug Drexler you're looking at right there. <laughs> I you know uh, under duress, under duress because oh, that was like but <laughs> to get to be able to you know, there's been a lot of Star Trek since the end of Enterprise and, and most of us who worked on the past shows really haven't, you know, been that approached or haven't been approached at all. Not be it's mostly because when you bring in an art director on a show, they know the people they've worked with and those are the people they want to bring with them to another show. And unless they're Star Trek geeks they don't really understand the, you know, the, you know, the history and the continuity and stuff. Right. And well, now, you know, well, I, but before, but let me say that the thing about Picard with Terry there, and with Dave Blass, who is a huge geek, it we we couldn't have ended up with a Star Trek that is going to give you so many of the feels as this one will, you know, as far as connections and tiebacks, you know, it feels like the same universe. Well, that was that was important. That was the first thing when because Dave Blast came on for season two, and the first thing I said to him, and by, by the way, he was way on board with this. Was we got to get the Akutas back? We got to get Doug back? We got to get the gang, the art department back together? Um, so it so it did indeed feel like what what Doug is saying. Like Terry, I and, wonder, I wonder if you could just define for a lot of people what a showrunner does. What's your day to day? I mean, you don't have to. It doesn't have to be, but but uh, an overview because I keep saying that you were the sole showrunner on Picard season three. Yes, that and, is true. And you had showrun Twelve Monkeys as well. By the way, I love that show. If you guys haven't seen the Twelve Monkeys series, please uh, watch true. it. It's terrific. But what is a showrunner? What are your responsibilities, and what exactly are you in charge of? Um. So the best way. There's an incredible documentary on it called Showrunners, which you should just watch. But um, it's the best, worst job to have because you are the final say on every aspect of, of the show, uh, from the writing to uh, producing it to uh, being on stage to working with the directors, making sure you're getting the performance and the feeling to the DPs, to the look of the show, to cutting it, to the score. Um, Pretty much the entire creative is it falls on you. So, um, so it's it's uh, it's mostly a lot of not sleeping. Specifically for season three of 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 Picard, I didn't. I don't really. I didn't sleep a full night for about. You can see it. In, in Terry, I don't know. I don't know how you do it. Really, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's so all encompassing. It is. It is. And and um, so, but in the season two, you know, Akiva w was was. I still had Akiva. Akiva was the driving force in season two, and I was there to to help uh, to you know, and hopefully kind of prove myself enough so that when they were re ready to hand over, they felt like there was a competent person to hand over a season three to. Um, but the um, so it's a little easier. When you have two people, it could also be difficult if you if you just have creative differences. But uh, for the most part, you have a partner. When you're on your own, you it's it's amazing because it's up to you. But it's up to you. <laughs> so, you know, and so, yeah, the sword of God is hanging over your head. Yeah, and when and when something doesn't work, you you feel it. You really feel it whether that's an editorial or on stage you jump you have to jump in and, and, and. well one of the things uh, like i uh, would you say that i convinced you that i was i did see stuff of what you've done i, I mean it's you, you, it's, you, you, pretty, you, it's pretty clear and uh, i and i, I and, and and you know this is what i said to you the other day i'm pretty sure i know how and it you didn't do any. Nobody did anything illegal. Uh, but uh, yes, yes, I would say it's, it's clear that you have. Okay, you have experienced Star Trek Picard. Yes, that that said, in a way, in a one way. of the one of the things that I um, was so taken by, and I think I'd asked you this, was I felt honestly that I was watching quote unquote real Star Trek for the first time since two thousand five, since maybe Demons and Terra Prime which was the last two-parter before, you know, the ill-fated last episode of Enterprise. Right. And I, I I asked you, I said, you know, how did you do that? 
<laughs> you know, because I, I understand well, that showrunners want to make shows their own. And everybody wants to take, and, and I feel that, that Star Trek has been, since 2009, people have tried to turn Star Trek into something else. Right. And what well, you did was you turned Star Trek back into what it was supposed to be, in my mind. I, I appreciate that. I don't know if that's, that's uh, look, I, 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 here's the thing. Here's what I think about Star Trek is I think there's a Star Trek for, for everyone. Um, I think maybe what you saw spoke to a Star Trek that you've been longing to see. I don't know. I mean, I think Strange New Worlds is Star Trek. I think I think they're they're uh, Picard in season one and two and Discovery. They're all they all live in the world of sure. a Star Trek. And what I think is interesting, and it wasn't until you know, look, I grew up like I kind of I came out here and 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 Doug, I want I don't want to just monopolize this, but. I was a kid. My first job was was being a PA on Star Trek Voyager when I when I was working. With, uh, <laughs> so, but what, it wasn't until and then I you know I went on to be Brandon Braga's assistant and, and whatnot. But actually being running a writers room with many different kinds of writers really illustrates to you everybody has a different Star Trek in their head. Oh, yeah. Right. Doug and I have a different, and we agree on so much. But there are things where I'll be like, wait, what? And he'll be like, yeah, what? And and I think it's okay. I think what the problem is, there is, there's not a tolerance. And I understand it because when you don't see enough of the kind of thing you're longing to see, it can be deeply frustrating. And there's franchises that are running now that I, boy, I sure wish I was seeing more of the stuff that I wanted to see. Um, so I, I guess I just have to say that is I think there's a lot of Star Trek for a lot of different people. And I'm very pleased that you've connected to what you know of this season. Well, I mean, here's here's the thing that I found interesting. Um, you know, Star Trek, I've always thought of it as a period piece of a future that never was. And and that period has been documented incredibly well on in multiple TV shows and in movies. And then beginning in 2009, all of that was sort of abandoned. Um, even when they make prequels, when they're doing Discovery and when they're doing um, uh, so Stranger Worlds. You, you, you don't like J.J.'s movie? Let's just say I, no, I don't. Really? Like JJ's. I don't. Nothing? Look, I appreciate what he did. I love the cast. I love the production values. I think it's, I think Star Trek 09 has the dumbest villain in science fiction history. A man who's gone back in time, and the reason he's angry is because his planet blew up, and he has, he's got modern technology. He could go, he's 100 years in the past. He could go to Romulus and go, hey, you guys, in 100 years, the Hope of Star is going to go Nova right. and destroy this planet. Why don't we take care of that problem? I, <laughs> anyway. Wait, I'll tell you, though, I, I, I think, look, and again, and again, this is the beauty of Star Trek, as we can agree to disagree, but I think the heart of starting with Spock and Kirk uh, and starting with their childhoods, I mean, I... I I, I, I connected to it. No, it's, it, I, 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 I don't. I, I, you know what I mean? But, uh, but, I, but I guess that that's, that's, the, that's the thing, right? The conversation that you and I are having is, I bet you you and I sit down and watch that movie, and you'd be like, all right, that is actually pretty great. No, there's lots of great. Star is great with a horror. You know what I mean? Like that kind of stuff. But here's what I would say what you have done and what everybody that worked on season three did was you extrapolated on characters 35 years or 30 years down the road, what would they actually be like? Characters that we saw for 178 episodes and four feature films. Right. We okay. know those characters. Yeah, okay. finding yeah. the character, yeah. So we can't, I, like, I, there's only so much I can talk Yeah, I don't want to, we don't want to spoil anything, but that's what oh, I, I liked. Okay. <laughs> because I felt like Star Trek Picard seasons one and two, I did not recognize the character of Jean-Luc Picard as the Picard that we had in seasons one and two, he seemed out of character. And well, I think that was the point, right? Where I, I, I think, and look, I'm, again, it's not to, to defend or condemn, but I think that was what they set out to do. Was here's a man who is waiting in his vineyard to die because he's lost his place in the world. So the character is fundamentally yeah. different. Yeah, but I don't believe that he would ever lose his place in the world. I think that was the well, problem. Well, that's the Luke Skywalker, Last Jedi. 
of it all too again and and that's what's tough i think about these franchises is yeah for me like i i actually there's i kind of love force awakens but when i first saw it it i was i was it was jarring to me that han solo and leia had a divorce luke skywalker is was missing uh you know like they're still fighting there's you know what i mean and because i in my head canon and canon canon of books it was uh there was a whole story that i had followed about you know so it is jarring i think also in the case of season three i think you're gonna have some of that too so if you if you've seen uh, you know what you've seen you know that some of these characters haven't seen each other in a really long time right they're not they're not at thanksgiving dinners together no but but i they... think for, for some fans i think in their minds that that's what they would like that they're all still serving and that and it, i get that i understand that but um, here's uh, here's the thing though i think that that you also have to believe one of the problems with last jedi is i didn't believe that han solo would allow the millennium falcon to slip through his fingers and not know where it was i would not believe that he would abandon and and those it's one thing to want to tell new stories and i understand that especially in franchises that have been around for so long but you also want to make those stories believable within you know you think about it there's an old western called the professionals you know and i always look to the professionals i'm like that was basically star trek for all these characters coming together you know they're they're old timers they're the over the hill gang to yeah, to do yeah. one last mission right and in the case of what you did with picard season 3 i believed even though people hadn't seen each other i believed that what you were telling me what you were, what the story that you chose to tell i i, I be- believed it and i well, have not I, I, believed I, star trek and well, I, would ask- I i will t- I'll, i take that as a comp- i appreciate that I, and and i i hope everyone Everyone else believes too when, when we get there. Oh, yeah. I mean, you, uh, but now I would ask you like the art department, you had Doug working, you had the Akutas working, and uh, Mr. Blass obviously is a, he's a yeah. big geek too. Art how, right. how, how important, you know, when you guys are working together, like when you're working with the art department, how important was it for you to have a continuity with what had come before? Extremely. I think it was this this show probably has had more of that than any show since the end of Enterprise, you know, where what had come before was really, really, really important. I don't, I, you know, it's like you said. Um, no spoilers, Doug. No, no. Okay. But start, <laughs> listen, this, if you're going to be a science fiction fan. Leap us. We're live, buddy. Oh, okay. If you're going to be a science fiction fan. I've always said that Star Trek is meant to be stretched a million different ways. Yeah. Let's see what we can stretch out of it. I also understand <clears throat> it's kind of comfort food. You know, there's certain flavors. It's like listening to a song that, that you love and you can anticipate every note. And if, if a note gets changed in the wrong place, you go to a concert or something, you know it, you know. You know, I went to see Psycho in a theater in downtown L.A. where they had an orchestra on stage playing Bernard Herman's score for Psycho. And I played that score so many times and watched that movie so many times. If one note was off, it right. would have ruined for me. And they were right on the money. It was mind boggling. So there's an incredible power there uh, for people who love the show and grew up with it. I think that you shouldn't expect to have that in every show. Try some other things, do things you'd never thought of. Someone will come along, you know, who will give you the comfort that you're looking for eventually. You know, I feel that's Star Trek. Picard season three. Well, I would, uh, let me ask you this, Terry, how beholden to you, f- I mean, obviously we now have these, this YouTube space where everybody can bitch and moan and complain about everything. How beholden did you feel as a creator? And I would say that you worked on Voyager and Enterprise and those at least, those are the last two shows that had the DNA of Roddenberry in the sense that Rick Berman had worked with Roddenberry and a lot of the people that worked on the shows worked underneath Roddenberry to the end of his life. Um, and obviously he wasn't perfect and he wasn't the, he wrote you know, with the Omega glory. Come on. But it's not like he's, he's, you know, he's things I like about Omega glory. I know, I know. he's not beyond reproach, but, he but, um, uh, how beholden do you think creators should be to the fan base and to, because obviously 
the franchise owners want to make money. So they want to appeal to the widest possible demographic. And at the same time, they know the fans are going to show up, but you always also want to get new fans. And one of the things I thought was interesting about what you've done is if you were a casual viewer of the next generation, you're going to love the show that you've created. Yeah. You don't have to be, a, and if you're a hardcore fan, so much the better. But how much, how much pressure did you feel and uh, from on up high and, and working with Alex Kurtzman and, and uh, Secret Hideout, what, what was that? How did you sort of thread that needle? Well, look, Alex and Secret Hideout and CBS and Akiva um, and Michael, too, couldn't have been more supportive of what I was doing. Uh, and, and I think um, they, too, would have done a lot of the things we'd done in season three if they could have uh, at the top of season one of the card. The bottom line is there was a, a very specific kind of show that was being developed, uh, you know, uh, for for Picard in the beginning. Um, and it's, you know, it, 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 so I think they achieved exactly that, that show. I don't think they could have done what we did in season three right out of the game. No one would have, no one would have allowed it. Um, Why do you think so, that is? Um, I think there was a a wise tendency to be like, we're not just going to get the gang back together to do Star Trek The Next Generation, which is also not what we do here. Right. Although this is a Star Trek The Next Generation sort of final cinematic experience and, and kind of a send-off. Um, oh, it's a 10-hour feature film. I mean, it really feels like you're watching the Next Generation movie you've always wanted to see. You really have seen. You really, you know. Oh. So, but you, but you, but by the way, if I was going to do, uh, uh the like a final two hour movie, I would it would have been an, a, a a very poor abbreviated version of this because you want to see where everybody is, right? Anyway, right. but back to your question is, um, the pressure, uh, certainly not from. There, there was no creative pressure from any anyone um, saying you've got to do X. Um, the I, I, the pressure that I had on myself was certainly to fans, but also to these legacy actors. Like each one, I called and said, "Here's where I think your character is. Where do you think your character is?" Mm. And let's and we were always on the same page. I was very lucky. Um, you know, the, because you also want to honor the canon that's come before. You know, Worf has a whole story about him being captain of the Enterprise and all these other things. And we didn't want to just come out of the gate and say, that didn't happen. But we didn't think he was, that was where he was right now. Right. So what was great was, and you, all you can do is smile, Robert. Don't you dare say a word. But when you meet him, it was a very specific idea, and he was, and Michael's like, "That's funny." I always saw him as X, and I was like, "This is so great." And 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 this and the idea of Jordy, um, this isn't a spoiler, but but we know Jordy has a, a, a family, and he has daughters and Starfleet. Um, that was very important to Lavar, to 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 see Jordy in a healthy relationship and not. Uh, as this sort of holodeck, yeah, stalker. Um, but see, that makes I, but that yeah. makes sense. You well, know, the right. fact that the fact that uh, look, one of the things I loved about Star Trek Generations is when you meet Demora Sulu. Yeah, you know, and true. and and she's she's on on the Enterprise B, and and th there's that whole when did they when did uh, anyone have time to go have a family? You know, and I think that, that that's what I mean when I say that you extrapolated upon where these characters are, were going to be, and it felt right. I, I will say it, the hardest thing is actually giving giving notes to, you know, like I was a PA. I met Jerry Ryan when I was a PA. We were friends. It was her first season on Voyager, and it was my first season riding around on that bike, Doug. You remember me riding around on that little bike. So, you know, um, but to be like actually I think I need you to do this or even like Doug Doug and, I, Doug and I worked very closely on a lot of the ships this season um and it's it's intimidating to give a note to it to Doug oh. to Johnny <laughs> oh, these guys know these guys know oh, the ships wow. better than I do yeah. 
but it's true. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, look at him gleefully. But it's hard. They, like I'm not, like I'm gonna tell Doug Drexler how to make it, <laughs> but I'll kind of be like, hey, can you make the cells? A little you know, bit more like the little bit more TOS movie. Can you do that? And well, and you know, and and we he's like, okay, well, we, how about this? And you're like, oh, that's it. It's a collaboration. I also did some pretty far out different engines. Absolutely did. Yeah. yeah we're very we old school 1960s. Like the round ones were really interesting too. Um, well, let but, me ask you this though. The two of you guys, hmm, how should I put this? I think it's fair to say that when Patrick Stewart said today at Star Trek Day that, that we're in space. We're in space now. And, and one of the things that I, I really enjoyed for whatever it is that I've actually seen, um, it felt like an extrapolation of the Star Trek universe from Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Voyager. We're 30 years on. It felt right. Like, I'm like, okay, I believe this. I believe Star Trek, the motion picture, the refit Enterprise. And in the case of what you all had done, I believed what I was seeing. I, I think that a lot of people who work on the show, and it's no fault of their own if they're not really steeped in the mythology, but there is a sense that you get from the technology and the ships and the space stations, whether or not it's the universe that you remember, you know, and... One of my, the greatest moments for me was, I think it was like a, one of the first shots in uh, season two where you see the stargazer mm -hmm. for the first time. And there's this loving, beautiful shot rolling across the surface of the ship. Yeah. And over I the think next I wrote in minutes, the script, this needs to be Starship Horn. It was perfect. And the fans went nuts. Yeah. And I don't remember which... Uh, site it was but they said that for the first time in recent history we looked at a starship and it had all the things we know belong there right and so when me the okudas john eves i think that you know me and okuda are probably the biggest sticklers um yeah when we when we're doing a ship it's like we make sure there's a phase of strip. We make sure there's a phase of turret. We make sure that there's a warp core egress. We make, you know, all this stuff that the people who have invested so much time and so much money in following, their joy is when they see the ship and they go, oh my God, the plate patterns and stuff make sense. It's just not like a nondescript plating thrown on. There's a logic, aircraft logic to everything. And now for those, just real quick, for those who might not have seen today's trailer. Here is, this is right out of the trailer today. This is the Titan, uh, and this was shown in the trailer, so this is nothing I, I, um, I didn't did do anything illegal here. But this is, this is the Titan, this is the hero uh, starship uh, of um, Picard season three. And uh, I love that it contains a lot of familiar design elements, and, and I really enjoy this. Even even the warp nacelles have uh, hark back to the Star Trek Phase Two TV series that didn't get made. The 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 shapes on the sides of the very the good cell. eye, you have a very good eye. Yeah, I mean, I really uh, really enjoyed that. I really love this ship. Now, obviously, people talk about, and I'll ask you both. There is the Titan that was created by Sean Tarangio, who won a right. contest for uh, Pocket Books. And that Titan was this Titan. And this Titan was on, this is the cover of um, a Star Trek novel. And then this ship was later uh, uh, canonical to um, Star Trek Lower Decks. So this appears in Star Trek Lower Decks. And then also in Star Trek Online there is this version of the Titan, uh, which is a, a different version of the Titan. Uh, the Star Trek, the Titan that was um, in, um, in Lower Decks and in, <laughs> in the novels was actually destroyed in Star Trek Coda by the Davidians in Intertime, if you're a Star Trek book fan. <laughs> Right. So I would I would be curious. Uh, you 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 settle on a Titan. Obviously, it's twenty five years later, canonically after Riker's Titan, so it's a brand new ship. 
right. where where what were some of these since we saw saw it in all of its glory today what was some of the philosophy behind creating this ship and what were you looking to do and doug and terry yeah. if you could speak about the I, development I love of the ship talk about this because it's interesting because uh I, I i today i was introduced to a new kind of star trek fan which is the hard hard hardcore starship folks oh that, yeah that, that i'm like wow okay um and god bless them god bless them by the way i i'm, I'm all for it i'm like, one of them just so i'm warning I'm one you of them, but, but i didn't agree with some of the things they said so when there's a plot reason that it's the titan um and so that it starts with story and it starts with character right uh the we sean's titan felt like it didn't necessarily fit in with um the sort of next next generation of ships that we had started with the stargazer with those right. kind of new nacelles the, you know um and we knew it was going to be a hero ship and look straight up i am partial to a classic constitution class ship and i this god bless you sir this design god bless this design you. actually uh started as a um as a fan built it uh bill kraus or bill kraus i'm not sure if it's, there's an extra but i discovered but, bill kraus okay gee, <laughs> he, he's a genius and so he it was a there was a thing called the shangri la class yeah. Yep. So we were we were going back and forth on many many different titans and some of them had the lower nacelles on it but it, that felt a little too reliant to me and i i wanted upward nacelles just straight up that's just what i wanted um and so i saw this design that bill had and i was like god it's pretty great what if for the, it started there for those and, of you who don't know bill kraus uh, does these unbelievably beautiful non-canonical starship models that beautiful uses. models not cg yeah. no he, he actually model builds models and he went he went he shows them at Wonderfest. I, I saw his stuff online and i invited him to do a page for the ships in the line calendar like in 2015. yeah and he's been doing a page ever since then and, and uh he's just brilliant i mean he loves it you know yeah and he's yeah, easy to great, work with he's, great, he's a true believer and yeah. so uh the idea was well what if the Titan started as a Constitution class kind of ship in in the TOS era, and and Bill designed uh, a, a a movie TOS era Titan that's a, that's a kind of Constitution class, um, and then it went to Sean's design was the idea, you know, and then and then so the idea was this one was a little bit of. Uh, Starfleet returning to some of this retro design, which we established in season two, which like with those nacelles. And I wanted a saucer. I wanted a classic saucer personally, because I, I felt like we were getting very elongated. The longer we went, you mm -hmm. look at like the, the, the they, they start to become less and less like the, the, the Star Trek that I grew up with. So, uh, you know, um, I, I, that's what I wanted. I, I wanted, uh, I wanted to feel some of that uh original series feeling but but also have something something new to it so we took we took bill's design and then we went into the art department and doug jumped in and dave and we when we worked on it and the, and visual effects chimed in and you know are there is it ever going to be look everybody's not ever never, some people are going to prefer sean's beautiful of course. design of course and and you know what we honor it in the observation room on the in the titan you will see a gold model of yep. his ship it yep. existed it's out there why is this the a did something happen it's a great question um but this is this one and it's okay if you if it's not your thing i love it but i think it's important that you what you just said is you you're, you honored sean's design you know yeah. canonically you took the time to actually and you do see it i mean if i'd seen the episodes you do see that gold ship of uh of of sean's uh design you can actually see it in the set yes so it's it's definitely but see here's what i mean this is this is what i think star trek fandom wants you know because so much of star trek fandom as it developed when i was a kid is no other tv show has as many books about its design starship blueprints and that, uh, that makes doing this very hard. 
Yes. It being in the writer's room and changing any kind of design. And my favorite thing is from a fan be like, well, clearly you didn't, you're not a Star Trek fan. You didn't know, we didn't know this. And we probably spent about 24 hours arguing about it in a writer's room. Well, you and did. Right. You knew this. Fine, fine. <laughs> but, but you know what I mean? But it's hard. Like it's sometimes we're just like, we're going to make a creative choice. You know, uh, Space Dock was a big was a big thing. Now, now talk about that because we saw a new. Uh, I would assume it's it, we saw a new space it's dock. You new, saw it, in the but it's familiar. It's familiar, yeah. And we saw that in the trailer tonight. There's a yeah. shot of the news, and it's beautiful. It is. Yeah. It is beautiful and huge. It feels like home. But that's that's what uh, yeah. It's exactly what we were trying to evoke. Is I, I wanted to get back to Starfleet. I I love the idea that right if you were to look up on Earth, you could see space dock pass over. And know that there are starships coming and going, and like I loved that about those original series movies, um, and even in next gen. I mean, space dock showed up. Scale was tricky because I don't know how the the doors, shake, but whatever. Um, I love space dock, and I wanted to get back to to that feeling, that nautical uh, high seas adventure of coming to port. You know, there was a little. There's a little thing in one of the episodes where we were just doing the. The um, the ADR the voice the voice of space dock like space dock command you're you're clear to proceed to Pier twenty four like it's all nautical terms you know the idea it's Gene Roddenberry's Horatio Hornblower uh, thing which was uh, I, again I think a thing that I think gets lost a little bit sometimes mm -hmm. uh, in in the discussion of Star Trek not in the product in the making of it but you know everybody's like it's it's about Star Trek is about optimism and, and it is it's all those things, but it is also a high seas adventure, um, and so that was was one of the the port essentially space dock. Right. No, I mean, but I think that there's I'm a rambling, lot of I'm rambling. I'm well, there's lot. a lot of decisions that you made that way, and and, uh, and e even like I have to say, I, I have not been a fan of a lot of the modern Star Trek costuming. And uh, uh, I would say that you you did a pretty good job of uh, alleviating those my dislike. Well, <laughs> can I say a that? A lot of credit goes to to a lot of other folk. On that. Sure. I think that would, uh, but mostly, I mean, you know, Star Trek to me is story like everything else, story and character. And I'm curious. Um, obviously, uh, writing a ten episode limited series is is difficult. What was the process of writing season three like for you? Uh, very intense, very intense. We had to, because they, we were shooting back to back seasons two, like we had to start season, season three of the day, like the day after season two started shooting, which I had done on 12 monkeys, um, uh, for the last two seasons. The difference though, for the last two seasons, 12 monkeys is we, we, we designed them that way. We wrote them all. Uh, we, we always knew going into this, that, that, Picard kind of was a bit of an anthology that there would be three separate stories um, and three different visions for them. And so um, I had to jump uh, from season two uh, and assemble this whole other room to get going uh, mm -hmm. so that we would make it in time. And I had a, I had a sketch. I always had it in my head what I always thought it should be, what I thought the threat should be, what I, sh I thought the last two hours were. I always knew where we were going. Um, but it, there, you know, we needed to, we needed to break it fast as writers in the room for 12 hours a day. Then on the weekends, we had to go get sign offs. I'd sit down with Patrick and pour him a glass of wine and be like, please let me tell you. There was a moment with, where uh, Akiva, uh, Akiva went over Patrick's and, and Akiva hadn't heard it either. He said, Patrick, I haven't heard this. He's like, they both poured a glass of wine and they sat there and I just told them this story. And, and it was a lot of things that um, Patrick necessarily didn't necessarily saw himself going back and doing, being back on a starship like this. Um, so I was, I was, I've never been more nervous in my life than that meeting. Like, I remember like getting ready and I'm looking down at my hands like, oh, don't blow this, do not blow this. Because if, if they say yes, you're going to get to tell this story that you've always wanted to tell um 
and so that was the process in getting signed on and CBS and Alex and you know you 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 need all these creative giants to say hey I, okay I think this is a thing, um, and then you got to go, and it's got to be good. You got you have to write. You're probably writing three scripts at one time, breaking breaking everything together, and then writing three at a time and rewriting, and it, it was really hard. There was a moment at the midpoint um, where there was one story we didn't end up going. It, it was a tough choice. It was, I can't say what it was, what it was gonna be. Um, but that is one of those things that's great about shooting at the same time is we saw, we have, there was a villain who, if you know who the villain is, you cannot say, do not, even, even, but this villain is, I think, is a fantastic. Well, uh, to be fair, it's 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 original. It is an original villain, but um, when we saw the performance, we we were like, we need more, much more, um, of that character. Um, and it's an uncharacteristic villain. I don't. Yeah, I don't know what you're talking about, but yeah. yeah. No, I mean, no, it, I mean, it's not. It's an original. I think yeah, you of, haven't seen this character before. No, it's and it's an original but you, take. But, but you know where that character fits into the universe. Yes. Yeah. So it's not, maybe not at first, but then once you know more. Let, let me ask you. <laughs> it, it it was it was surprising, and I would ask you when the idea us. came to you. Robert, I don't know where you're going with this, but we cannot. No, no. All, all I'm going to say is, did you ever, did you get any pushback for, with this idea that you had for the villain? Um, no, because uh, um, because the, the nature of the villain gave you so much story, right? You know, and once you once you pitch it and be like, now here's what this means. It I means will never like, betray you, sir. I will ask you very general questions. No, no, no. I know, but but the the nature of this villain story, uh, it's seemingly one thing, and then you, the more you get to know, it's uh, it's like an onion, right? Um, and it just gave you more story. And every time we told it, people were like, "Oh, that's well, that's really cool," because then you could do this, and you're like, "Yeah," and then you could do this, yeah. So it was. So uh, and it, I, I'm curious, like when you guys started developing. When you have these scripts written, does the do you obviously the art department when you're working so fast the art department you you had to build this this is jumping around this this story goes all over the place, and the art department and the production design Mr. Blass, uh, how how quickly when the scripts run fast and 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 you know again you, it, it, there's a sizable budget to this show but not nearly enough for the ambitions that we had right so you have to be really smart there are there are sets that are you know we say in the industry swing sets which are uh sets that you redress and hopefully don't know that you've redressed them mm. there's one i'll tell you at the end uh, you know once it aired i'll be like this set was this set was this set and you're gonna be like what no way the but, expanse uh, did a very good job of that you have we to it's the nature of television you have to for speed for um budget for all all the things it just you have to be able to do Doug was it hard for you with this compressed schedule was the art department well, I mean, beleaguered your your hair is always on fire working on a show you know it never isn't you have some lulls but it's usually you know the lull before the storm you know i if you can't handle the insanity and the pressure and and having this big rock rolling behind you, then you're in the wrong business because right. that's part of what comes with it. It's part of the territory. You have to learn to actually enjoy it. You know, uh, uh, I actually, I mean, there are moments of joy and there are moments of sheer terror when you're working on a show. But ultimately, it's thrilling to be able to be in a position like that where it's there's so much at risk and you have so little time. Mm. Um, you know, if you don't like that, forget. Go go home. <laughs> <laughs> so Terry, how long did it take to write the whole season, and and did you have to wait till all ten scripts were finished, or no, were you getting no. approvals as you went along? No, we had to we had to shoot and write at the same time. Um, but we need we broke it. My, I'm a 
I, I'm a hardcore, I want the map before I even write the first word. Um, with room to pivot, because you'll find things in production when you're shooting, like that character is popping or that character is not popping or we thought this was going to go this way. Um, but you want the map and with 12 Monkeys was an intricate time travel saga. So we needed to know they were running into their 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 time traveling selves from the finale uh, uh, of the series two seasons in. So we needed to know exactly the roadmap. So that was a good training for this. Uh, so I think ultimately, I think we, we wrote this over four, four five months, four or five months. Yeah, which is a long time. Uh, Chris F. sends in a super chat and says, Terry, I, I'll be honest. I was not a fan of Picard season one and two, but I'm looking forward to season three. These characters have the last of Roddenberry's DNA. Oh, thank you, Chris. Well, I hope you like it. Uh, Cardinal Sin says he just got back from seeing the Wrath of Khan in a theater, and he I cried. It's so bad. I know he cried more than usual because this time he was grieving for Leonard Nimoy and his entire body of work, as well as the character of Spock. So I mean, so so this was, I, I mean, how long was the entire production schedule of Picard season three? Ooh, see, started shooting in the fall, um, February, about six, six months, six months. Wow. Six months of shooting. Um, now, you know, it's harder now in COVID because you shoot less. Um, um, it, it's quite, it's very challenging. Um, the good news is we were a Starship show. Um, so we locations weren't uh, a problem. Season two was was tricky because um, we had we were doing uh, sort of a present day story, and COVID mm -hmm. was just an, I mean it was at the peak of COVID, right? Um, and so yeah, Doug, you can bring your parrot on. Yeah, I want to meet the parrot. Yeah, I mean he, he if he was out front, he'd be yelling to come back here. He likes to be in on the. What's on his the name? Show. Beaker. Beaker, like the Muppet. Yeah, that's perfect. And now, how old? Tell the tell the audience how old he is. Hold him up. He's hold him up in front of you. Forty yeah. years old. Oh my God. Forty, 40 years, years old. old. I've had him since he was a baby. Come wow. here. You want to go open the door? Go ahead. Amazing. So okay, I mean, I guess, now I guess he wants to stay here. Well, hey, he can stay. Have him on the show. We haven't had a forty-year-old pair. This is a first for me. He knows a lot about Star Trek, believe me. <laughs> well, he's been there. I mean, today is the 56th anniversary of the entire franchise, so he's been alive for the majority of it. Yeah. Um, yeah he finally became a fan. But so, Terry, you, you – now, how long is the post-production process? How long did post take for you? Um, I mean, post starts the second you start shooting. Right. Um, so tack on another – three months to that so it's almost like it's about a year almost by the time you're done wow yeah i would say 11 months 10 to 10 10 to 11 months no i just finished last week the whole thing the whole oh thing. i i i'd love to see what you've got when it's all done because <laughs> I, I have to wait yeah. till i see it on on february 16th it yeah. airs that we yeah. announced today I just found out yeah february 16th but now i have oh, to yeah. there is one thing there's one thing I first thought that, let's just say what I saw, I thought it was like temp tracked. One of the things that I realized joyfully is that, wow, this is music I've never heard before, but it was very familiar. Yeah, we and hard on the music. It's like when, um, when Brian Singer was making Superman Returns and they wanted to bring back the John Williams Superman theme that was very important and John Ottman did variations on it. And I have to say, uh, the music, I would assume what I heard was fairly i don't know whatever i can you get have to tell me but the music is absolutely I spectacular know. i don't know what level well um i agree with you chilling I don't, know, I don't know if you heard temp tracks or if you even really did hear anything but the uh the score oh is... i heard <laughs> the score is so um i brought um uh, stephen barton is a longtime collaborator he's a composer on uh on uh, 12 monkeys he's done a lot of a uh, lot of video game stuff a lot of award-winning video game things um 
Um, I was deeply involved in the score for 12 Monkeys. I mean, his office was right next to mine. And, and I knew like Jeff Russo, who was brilliant, is not, he, he's, he's, he's very busy. And there's no way I was going to be like, Jeff, uh, I want you to have your office next to mine so we could do music all day. There was going to be like, what? You're out of your mind. Get out of here. Um, but Stephen was, that's just something we love. And so the, 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 the notion, the, the, the goal for this was to be like, what if Jerry Goldsmith was still alive? What if James Horner was still alive? Um, what if Dennis McCarthy was still doing this? Um, there's nods to other people too that I, 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 won't, I won't say, um, but to really get uh, that big symphonic Star Trek sound. Um, now the problem with doing that is it takes a tremendous amount of time. I mean, you're, they, they, they're writing a movie a week. So uh, uh, in fact, there, it, there came a moment around episode seven where Steven was so burned out because he was right. I mean, it's when you hear the score, by the way, we're trying to get the soundtrack out before it releases. So you have an overture so that people can listen to two hours right. of music. Um, right. I know John E's will love it because it's so Jerry. Um, but uh, there was a moment around episode seven where seems like I need help. So we brought on uh, Frederick Weedman, who I believe you've worked with. Yes. Yes. He scored a movie I produced called The Hills Run Red. Right. But, but, but by the way, I, I just to be clear, he showed me your nothing. Fre I, I know Frederick would never do that. Uh, he, uh, but the uh, he's brilliant as well. So he is brilliant. Uh, so he came in as an assistant, and he and Stephen brought it home. Uh, and and in, I mean, when you hear the last two hours of this, I mean, it's it. I think I believe it'll be one of the best scores of 2023, without question. No, and I'm it's... pretty critical when it comes to score, but uh, this is phenomenal. I cannot say. Well, now, so um, the there is one track you will just sob listening to it if you're a hardcore Star Trek fan. Oh, I, 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 I think I know what you mean, and you're not wrong. <laughs> if if I think I know what you mean, I don't know. I can't. You know, one day we're gonna have to sit down and go over all this. Yeah, I, I have a feeling. I, I was okay, but go ahead. Yeah. No, I mean, that, that was one of the things, and you forget because, look, even the original series, when La La Land Records 10 years ago put out all of the score of the original series, including music you'd never heard before, it is my single favorite music release of my lifetime because I never thought I would get it. And that music, it was so weird because I'd watched classic Star Trek so many times. Putting on that music, I've never heard music that had such an emotional response in me like yeah. i couldn't and i i don't know let's just say what i experienced i don't know what was temp track and what was new but what was so weird was it was all familiar but then i'm like wait a minute this is new i haven't heard this before yeah, that you probably heard and yes. and it was and i have to say there are times when i was like oh my god like i literally was shook listening to what apparently you've done and I, I it made me realize i'm like why don't why hasn't people why don't they do more of this i mean you know a lot really? of people have been complaining lately about how oh well why did they go back and just use the game of thrones music for house of the dragon and it's like they always use the star wars theme for new star wars movies yeah, by the way when when i got to the second episode and they played the game of thrones i was i screamed i was so happy oh uh, yeah they played that i, I mean that's like, you know, that's Who game. Of want to hear that theme for the rest of their lives. Oh, some people just want to complain. I guess, I, like, I understand, like, well, they were hoping for something new and as iconic, but it's Game of Thrones, and it it feels like anyway. Uh, but there's a uh, Kevin, our friend Kevin Rubio says, Doug, how is designing a ship for Star Trek different than designing a ship for Battlestar Galactica? Because of course, Doug, you were in a, you worked in visual effects on. Uh, Ron Moore's reboot of Galactica, and you worked on Caprica and Blood and Chrome. Yeah, well, I mean, Galactica is a little more gritty and hardware looking, you know. Uh, Star Trek has this kind of, Roddenberry called it technology unchained, where you were designing not just because form follows function, because it's beautiful. Galactica isn't like that, except for the Vipers. 
the vipers tend to be very sleek and beautiful but look at the galactica it's a bunker you know and uh there's a certain beauty that comes with the utilitarian quality of it but but uh starfleet and the gene roddenberry universe it's all about uh uh, not just performing, but being beautiful, you know. Uh, a, a lot of time is spent to make sure that these things look inspiring. And you don't really, that, that isn't the design ethic uh, as far as go, the Galactica goes. You know, I, I will say the Vipers are beautiful. I, uh, God, I love them. I love really the new beautiful. Viper and the old Viper. I, yeah, I, I and I they did. They honored both. They did such a good job building the full-scale models. I mean, when we were on Star Trek, usually shuttlecraft are like flat sides, right. <laughs> you know, and 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 we had a beautiful one on, on Next Generation, the one they gave to Scotty, you know, in Relics, uh, which I think was built from what was left over from Star Trek V, probably. Oh, really? Oh. Yeah. And they they only built a wedge too, for Relics. Yeah. I mean, they just they had a wedge when they they it was really they were really limited in how they could shoot that. Yeah, um, but so. I find Star Trek and Galactica both share uh, that love of aircraft logic, you know, and I think the first time I heard that came from Matt Jeffries. You know, we used to go out to his hangar uh, where he kept his plane uh, uh, west from here. And, uh, and he, was a, uh, he was a flight engineer on a B-17 during World War II, yeah. you know. So everything he did had aircraft logic, and he really understood the engineering. People like Mike and I and Rick Sternbach, we never, we, we understand the basics of it and what it is that makes it unique. But who designed Starfleet without that aircraft logic? It just doesn't look like Star Trek. Star Which Trek is, feels I, like I love know. that the Cylon Raider was a Cylon. Oh, yeah. That was so cool. That yeah. The it, it's a, it's beautiful. Was, it's really was, beautiful. Was, I mean... Gary Hutzel deserves a lot of credit on Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. Um, you know, he had a lot of good people working on the show. And Lee Stringer, you know, it's a, you know, a great mention. Uh, you know, he's brilliant. But uh, yeah, I was so impressed when I saw Galactica because basically he took something that by the time we were getting to Enterprise was getting a little creaky, you know, ships flying from left to right like ships on a lake and stuff like that. And it still looked beautiful. But when Gary came in, you know, he took a cue from uh, Steve McNutt, who was the DP, who was shooting it as if it was a documentary crew. Right, the snap zooms. Yeah, snap zooms. It, on Star okay. Trek, the camera is the eye of God. It right. knows where the ship is going. It knows what's going to happen. On Galactica, the camera is motivated by what's happening around it. You know? It's so good. Yeah, it, 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 it's a it, mess. Mess. Top three television series of all it's amazing time. and uh, what's amazing to me is that there are many many star trek fans who haven't given it a chance and i know they'd love it but there's a certain loyalty that comes with being a star trek fan i don't understand that because it is very star trek in a lot of ways oh, and it's, very, uh, it's, in, it's in, more in, star trek than it was the original galactic absolutely yeah i mean just the military aspect of 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 how adama ran that ship in a time of crisis in those those conversations with him and Ross. Brilliant. Brilliant. I mean, we we do a podcast just on Battlestar alone and I'd fill it with four and a half hours. Yeah. Now, I mean I wept incredible time and show, watching well it. since we you guys brought it up, I really loved Daybreak, the final episode. Oh I do too. And, and you know, there's that shot at the end. I'm really proud of it. Um there's where the Galactica jumps with its flight pods out. And when it comes out the other side, it basically breaks its back. Yeah. That's what happens if you jump with the flight pods out. And uh, we had done, one of the guys had done a shot where, I think in the script it describes the Galactic as twisting, almost like a pretzel. And somebody actually did that shot, and it looked so ridiculous. And um, Gary asked me to do it. I had an idea. I wanted it to look like um, that they hit a brick wall when they came out of it. And when you watch that shot where it hits that wall and those flight pods do this, oh, it's stuff great. is falling out the front, you totally buy it. Well, that brings up the, the actual... Oh, wait, and i got to mention one other thing. You know where that comes from? The Blues Brothers. <laughs> really? There's, there's the scene 
see, when Voyager got back to Earth, the ship looked squeaky clean, made it back, and we always yeah, joke. Yeah. Okuda and I, who love the Blues Brothers movies, always joke that this Voyager, like the Bluesmobile, should have sprung apart. Yeah, it should have you know? lived to the finish line. Yeah, exactly. So when we did that last scene in Battlestar Galactic, we said, oh my God, here's our chance to do the Bluesmobile springing yeah. apart. And, and that's what totally influenced it. Well, yeah. I got to ask you, Terry, um, you know, what I experienced. I should say that the effects, the um, what was your philosophy behind the effect shots? Because I thought that maybe there's an elegance brought back uh, a focus on on the actual uh, the because you're shooting in the Star Trek film format two three nine or two three five to one. Yeah. Um, you're using the the wide screen, which is very cinematic. I mean, Discovery has done that as well, all the way, but Modern Trek yeah. has done that. But, but I love that Alex instituted that in this show. I think it's so great. Thank the, God. The anamorphic thing is fantastic. Yeah. Um, do you guys really do you guys shoot anamorphically, or are you shooting spherical and then matting it down it, to? It, yeah, it's that. Yeah. It's, uh, it, so, we, but we, still, you go for the the. You know, I don't actually know the answer to this. My DP would put a gun in my head right now if he knew. It's I okay, did. but but I, I, but I'm fairly certain we don't. But uh, anyway, go ahead. But with the well, like what you did with the music, did you do the same thing? Was did you have a, an well, edict with the visual effects as well to ha to add yeah. that more elegance back into? And th they well, I mean, look, uh, there's a great team there: Jason Zimmerman and Brian Tatosky and them all. These guys, you, you know, I I was if I had my druthers, if if I was starting from scratch, I would still do models. It would CGI enhance. Um, I, I just think there's, I, I still look at the motion picture and Kirk looking at the refit and I believe it's real. This, the yeah. scale of it feels real. It feels like you can touch it. There are parts of independence day. If you watch it, just shots of the mothership where you're like, that's real. That's yeah. not CGI. Um, so starship troopers, same thing. Starship they use right. models and uh, CGI, star, right? So the, the idea is like, but pushing, you know, it's, it, and it's hard because, um, it, I mean, it's the, the visual effects industry is just so underwater right now. There's yeah. not enough, uh, um, uh, not enough uh, people, uh, workforce, and there's such a high demand on what they do for not a lot of money, not a lot of time. So um, it's hard to push back and say, it's got to look better. It's got to look real because they're doing their damnedest. <laughs> to give you that um but 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 there is an element of like show you know and then and then sometimes it's just problem solving it's like it needs more shadow it needs more of this and we don't always you don't always nail it you, you just don't have the time um but then again you go to some of the biggest movies out there now and they don't always nail it because of the same right. issues there's it there it's just an overwhelmed industry right now um and they're gonna i mean that's gonna be tough they're gonna have to, they have, they're gonna have to figure that out because i don't think it can sustain itself and there's so much demand uh when we started getting to the end of this thank god we did great with the, the visual effects are phenomenal at the end but there were vendors saying ah, we're full we can't we're good no more we don't care what it is we just <laughs> can't do it um so it's a good time for anybody out there who's young to get into the visual effects world because there's a demand. Um, uh, Six Scale Mafia says, wow, what a panel. As Rob knows, I'm a diehard Trekker. Doug Drexler, amazing to see you. And Terry, hello to you too, sir. I am looking very forward to Picard Season 3. Well, thank you. Tell, tell him I'm, I'm only here for Doug Drexler as well. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. uh, some old guy in ha Hawaii says, Doug, is that the Proteus on the shelf behind you? Wow, you got sharp eyes. That's the Proteus. I'm a big Harper Goff fan. Wow. I got a four-foot Nautilus in the uh, living room. You got to explain to everybody what the Proteus is. Well, the Proteus was a submarine from a movie called Fantastic Voyage, which really is one of the greatest science fiction films ever made. In fact, um, uh, God, what's wrong with me? That guy who wrote 2001, <laughs> Arthur C. Arthur Clark, C. Clarke, yeah. recommended 
that uh, Kubert watch Fantastic Voyage before doing 2001. Yeah. And I, I still watch that film regularly. It, it, it's remarkable. And the submarine itself is so convincing. They yeah. built the thing full scale, inside and out. And Harper Goff designed the Nautilus in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which was directed by Richard Fleischer. And Fleischer went on to do Fantastic Voyage. And so he got Harper Goff because he knew the guy had what it took to make you believe in a submarine. But um, yeah, it's different designs. Uh, Tom Jr. Jackson says, hey, Rob, I love this conversation with you and your guests. Love the Blues Brothers references, too. <laughs> Hey, the Blues Brothers always figured very strongly in Star Trek right from Next Generation. Mike was a big Blues Brothers fan. And uh, I think that the dedication plaque was inspired by a plaque that was on a bridge in the Blues Brothers. <laughs> it gets a quick shot. And uh, we put the, the Blues Mobile license plate number on spaceships and, you know. <laughs> so, Terry, now that, you know, obviously I want to thank you for your time. You know, I know you said you had to leave, but you, you're hanging out. So Good, I appreciate that. I want that. to ask you a question before I leave. So go ahead. Uh, well, so obviously today is Star Trek day and you, you began as a PA on, on, um, on Voyager Boy, yeah. and you worked on enterprise. You became brands assistant. Now you've literally brought back arguably the most beloved cast, but what does Star Trek mean to you? What does it mean to you, not just as as um, not just as a job, but like as part of a franchise that's now fifty six years old? It's half a over more than half a century old, and now and and you've gone, you're at the fucking crap table here. You've gone or not crap table, I should say poker table. You're all in on this. I mean, you 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 you're you're sing you're 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 like the the wily e. coyote that you've run off the cliff. And and the fan base and the studio, they're all the roadrunners standing on the edge, and you you haven't realized that there's nothing below you, and you're going to fall into the chasm. You've got all in. Goes, Oops. I mean, I mean, you know, That's I'm not a terrifying way of putting it, Robert. But, uh... <laughs> so um, so, what does it mean? What does it mean to you on this on this Star Trek well, day? Look, I, I'm not going to be able to give you some beautiful, eloquent answer that says, well, it's about Gene's vision of a better sure. future and all those things, because it is all those things. For me, it's Sunday afternoon with my father um, watching the original series, um, going to see all those movies in the theater, um, remembering the premiere of, of Star Trek The Next Generation. It was a family event for me. And it was always, again, this is the television and film cliche, but it was always kind of about family, right? Um, I did it, uh, or I often defend Star Trek III uh, Search for Spock because I love so much about how that's a story about a family going to save someone they love. Well, then um, they throw it all away. And they throw, exactly. And, and, and he loses family along the way. And, you know, I was what, <clears throat> I was what, 84, I think, when that came out, or you yeah. know, 82, or whatever it is. No, Star Trek yeah. 3 is 84. 84, so I'm a nine-year-old kid in that theater. I saw it three times, and it just resonates with me. And so, um, and then, and again, in Next Gen, and, you know, there's, uh, I mean, when First Contact came out, I saw it five times in the theater with my friend Seth Graham Smith, who's another writer. Um, and, um Look, it's an immersive escape. It's a, it's a, it's a rousing adventure. It's so many things, and again, I, the, the thing about a Star Trek day, where, where, um, and it's the things that you mentioned, like there's the Star Treks you don't like. I see people love Star Treks that don't necessarily resonate with me, um, specifically that I enjoy, but aren't like, oh, you know, I seek out. Um, but to the to so many people, it, it does. So I think there's a Star Trek for everybody. Uh, that's that's kind of unique. I don't even I can't really say Marvel has that. I'm going to um, say Terry is is Star did Star Trek somewhere along the way may have had something to do with Enterprise and the Temporal Cold War splintered the reality into multiverse like Marvel. I mean. Right. There, there are shows where I don't think they're in the same universe, that they're in a universe that is, is at a slightly right. different frequency, yeah. you know? Right. Akiva and I used to talk about that, actually, when we were in season two. It was like, 
it feels like there's, but you know, we never went towards a, a, a multiverse, but there does feel like there's a multiverse, right? Well, it's like, a way to explain the difference. Of of that things could have gone, even anyway. But um, so it's hard to. It means so. I mean, look, it's. Uh, there were times when that music was was there for me in my darkest hour, you know, uh, just score. Um, as a professional relationship, I love that I'm on here with Doug. Doug was one of the first guys I met when I moved out to LA. He was just a nice. He didn't have to be nice to that little stupid <laughs> gay who was asking all these Star Trek questions, but he did. Mike, and Denise, and Jim, and John, and all those guys. So, and Jerry, like Jerry Ryan's one of like a great friend of mine. I was a PA while she was just coming on a seven nine. It's really and everyone's so proud of you. They, yes, <laughs> yeah, she's you really are. I, I, I love her. Marvelous. So, um, but so there's a it, it's so it's so many things like you, Robert. Now, like uh, I'm like I like this guy. When I met you at the Hollywood Bowl, I was like. He's a really sweet guy. Well, uh, well, that's very nice. You know, and and um, I think it's a community. I think it's so many things. And again, look, look oh, yes. let's not let's not overlook its importance to diversity and inclusion and all those things. It, it to me, it, it, there's this strange thing, and this is all. I don't want to go into a tangent. It's sort of this back weird backlash with rings of power that there's diverse casting in it. It's the strangest thing. It's weird. It's so it, – it, and people are like, well, it's racist. I'm like, it's actually not racist. It's extreme racism to say that there's an, there, there's an African-American character in Lord of the Rings and that's wrong. It's craziness. Crazy. And why like, does Empire Strikes Back when no. was Lando Calrissian, were they screaming woke at the screen when, when that happened? Like, I don't – there's some weird, bizarre, backward step. Find something to do. What the hell? In society that is chilling. Well, you know, um, part of it is, of course, the internet because everyone's got a voice. Everyone has a voice now, and yeah. that's exactly right. Like, their social media is the like today. Like, I don't know why I was looking for negative things about that trailer, but I looked. <laughs> oh, and you found them. And I found them. <laughs> oh, I, I did too, because I looked and I'm, too. And I'm so like, and I act surprised that this chucklehead with three <laughs> followers is 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 snarking at me. Um, and so, uh, you know, I don't, it, it, it's, I, I think it's a strange time. And I think it is social media has turned us into a board collective and a hive mind that doesn't, that's schizophrenic, that doesn't yeah. understand itself. It really has. But the thing is, you're always going to have people who are basically unhappy or they're having a terrible home life. They go home miserable. Right. Well, now, hang on. If, if I may, if I may, um, like I'm with you guys. I'm with you guys, but if I might offer a alternative point of view, like for instance, I remember when Voyager, when when Tuvok, they created the character of Tuvok, you know, and and T Tim Russ, by the way, I think Tim Russ as Tuvok is my second favorite Vulcan, as you should, behind Spock, behind Leonard Nimoy, Spock, Spock. I, right there with you. Well, Be Sarek. I'll well, oh, well I, okay, you know what? I yeah. include Sarek and Spock as yeah. a yeah, yeah, right. like okay. Mark Leonard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Mark Leonard That's and Spock. Amazing. He's so good. Yeah, yeah. Mark Leonard and, and they're the best Vulcans. Celia Lofsky as T'Pau is great too. Yeah, <laughs> and so, and so is Arlene Martel as uh, as uh, T'Pring. Yeah, but but I did think Tim Russ um, as Tuvok in, in Voyager. By the way, I'm very excited to get Exo Six's Tuvok, or maybe I already have it. Do I already have it? I might have it. Make it oh, oh no! Wow. Yeah, the, the, check this out. X06 is putting out Cisco and Tuvok. Those are the next figures that come out. Yeah, those wow. are beautiful figures. They're, they're such they're such great they figures. Me, they by the me you and it's phenomenal. By the way, I really hope. Uh, I have not. I mean, I shouldn't say this. But I'll say it anyway. I did not buy Saru and Michael Burnham. I did not get those. But you don't. Okay. But but in Star Trek Picard season three. Uh, you better, Nanjin, talk to that dude because there's some figures I want. <laughs> we're, I mean, we're, there are. Get on that, son, because he, you know, I might have, I might have sent him your way, and he might have thanked uh, me for is that you guys how talking. He each? Okay. <laughs> might um, have, he he did send me an email saying thank you for. <laughs> I might have pushed him on you. I hope he's not, you know. Uh, no, no, no. I, look, they are. 
what a gift to the Star Trek community those figures are. I mean, oh my god, I, I have Q on my. They sent me Q on my shelf, and it's it's phenomenal. The, I was the, looking at John Delancey about it today at Star Trek. I was like, "Do you have the thing?" He's like, "It's really good." I'm like, "I know." It's <laughs> no, it's it's uh, it's. But what's your counterpoint of view? You were you were starting. Oh, to say, oh, well, well. Here's the thing. I think it's when when it was interesting because if you really think about it, you know the the different races of people on our no, I should, well, there's only one race there's the human race but the different ethnicities on our planet are basically genetic differences based on where we grew up you know where you come from and because that's your environment was was what as human evolution occurred that's what happened and like for instance on vulcan human evolution vulcan vulcan evolution wouldn't exactly be the same so the idea that people would look this as similar to ethnicities on earth is kind of silly but it's okay because we have human beings playing vulcans and actors if you really run it if you if you to really run it back down vulcans aren't real so all we have is you it's like human beings like on star trek you know michael westmore couldn't like jj abrams actually bought brought in gigantic fish people on the bridge you know cg yeah. characters so when you really think about it the the I understand where people can get caught up in like well, depending on where people came from. But when you're thinking about the fact that human beings are limited to human beings to use to create fictional creatures, like hobbits would not necessarily look like. I mean, Peter Jackson just used technology to shrink down people with blue screen or green screen to make Gandalf look taller than the hobbits. Hobbits wouldn't look. If you look at the illustrations from Tolkien's books, they don't really have the same proportions as human beings do. Right. So I, 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 I'm, I'm mostly referring to just straight up social media race, racist bullying and, and just oh, sort yeah. of in, insane toxic anger. Look, there's, there's a franchise that I love that had a show that I really, that it, it upset me. I did not like... You and I talked about this at the Hollywood Bowl, Robert. It's a specific. It's a specific show. I didn't like what they they did, but I didn't go on to Twitter and sadly, angrily write and scream to the world about how how upset I was, or, or specifically target. Like I'm always amazed at somebody who targets a showrunner saying this was shit. And you're like, that's like like going to a restaurant and you didn't like your meal and going to the back of the kitchen and spitting in the jet like really? I, i'm guilty of that, that though man really? like, that, you I'm, are guilty of that i'm guilty i'm guilty i was are. guilty i i think the reason we started talking is because i yes, slammed you i don't understand like I, here's the only thing that i because I, I did slam you you did i because you said you said that you, we're going to give the next generation cast a great send-off and i was like Fuck off, dude! I know and that, and all good. Like, all good all things, things is a send off. Send off. I'm like, yes, and I said, but sadly, they made four other movies after, so it wasn't a send off. But so. that's when you wrote me and you said, "Hey, I really liked." I right. slammed you on social, that wasn't and, what I heard from and then you. you wrote back and you said, "I really like Free Enterprise," and I'm like, "Oh, oh man, I love Free Enterprise." And then I, I wrote back and I go, "But I love Twelve Monkeys," and then we started. But see, I guess, I guess the the thing is. But here's the thing that I understand about you now, and you are a controversial figure, as you well know, and some of these disregarded. I think that level of passion comes from love, right? So if you can find a way to see past that anger as to why it's I mean, there's some people who just do this to make money. Like there's the the, the business of hatred is incredible. I, I just I just learned of the hate YouTube video things and the, and the money people make off of just, here's my dissection of the thing that I hate. And that's extraordinary. God bless and make a paycheck. If you got to do it, I question what you're doing for the world, but that's okay. You, you, you can do it. I guess I try now to, to, to see where it comes from. And in the case of you, what I understand about you now is you just, love star trek <laughs> i so do much. so much so you made a movie starring captain kirk you know and, and, I kind of and revitalized you, shatner's career in a lot of ways. and you and you have a strong opinion and so it's hard to 
I, I think it can be unfair to creatives who, who the bottom line is also you don't know what um, now I'm rambling and I got to go. Well, no, but, you, but, but what I'm saying is you don't know what a creative went through to get to that product. Anyway. Right. Like there's a lot of other so many hundreds of thousands of other. But Doug, you know, you've been in production meetings where you hear a creative was like, I want to do X. And then you see what happens. You're like, you can't do that because of many, any, many other um, spheres of power. But anyway, I'm rambling. I, well, listen, one of the things I learned was that no matter what you do, <laughs> half the people are going to hate it. It doesn't matter what you do. Half well, of them are going to hate it. Half of them are going to love it. Look, there, there are people that think that I'm shilling for you. There, there, there are people. There, you there, people. there, there, there are, it's so funny. There, no, there are people that are that are convinced. It's true. That, and and I'm like, hey, you know what? Uh, if you want, it does look like it sometimes. I mean, I was like, you're, I you're, flat you're out so said, passionate. you're so passionate. I get it though, but yeah, the people were like, where's your? Well, it was a Paramount paycheck or something. Yeah, like, and yeah, I'm like, yeah, the thing is, I'm I've always I've often said. I am happy to take a paycheck and shill for anybody. The problem is that's not what Hollywood does. They're right. not paying this weird thing that they're paying you or you're part of the access well, media and all you. that. They pay Pat Oswalt or like somebody with a trillion. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, it's it's and and the thing is, I've worked professionally like I worked on the Star Trek. I was a I was a paid Star Trek consultant in the 90s when Voyager was new. They brought really? me in. Yeah, I was I was on the payroll. I worked for Paramount or Viacom licensing. And so that was my first, and the reason they hired me, this is so funny, was they were, they had made, Viacom Interactive had made a Voyager video game, and it was terrible. And because it was the same the company, thing, right? what's that? Was it a Borg thing? No, it wasn't, it was, it was a, something else, it was so bad. Mm. And they, they couldn't, they couldn't internally say it was bad, so they needed to hire an outside consultant, which was me. And when I came in and, and wrote this paper about how terrible it was, and then they kept me on, and I was consulting on what makes good Star Trek product and all that. And it was, I wrote a really impassioned paper about why they shouldn't let, they, DC had the Star Trek license and they were doing a great job, and Marvel wanted it. And I'm like, don't take it away from DC. They're doing such a great job of the comics. And then I worked on the Star Trek experience for yeah. two years, editing all the stuff. And then I worked for CBS on uh, the Blu-rays, making the documentaries right. with and Roger Lay. Right. And, and, and that's where I know of you mostly from, is because my old colleagues, Brandon and David Goodman, everybody speaks very highly of, of what you did there and yeah. how thoughtful those behind the scenes. Like, you, you're, you, again, it comes, you're all heart. And yeah. so that was why I was like, I love Free Enterprise. Well, Roger and I, you know, Roger Lay, and he he brought me on, and we were and we were at Doug's house. You know, we shot the art department reunion at Doug's house with uh, Herman Zimmerman, and and yeah. and and you guys hooked us up with all those people. Um, John John Dwyer, you know, who worked on the original series, we were able to interview him before he passed away. What a thrill to have him around, man! I mean, it was it was, and yeah. So Star Trek is, <laughs> but the thing is. What people don't understand is I'm just about story and character. And when I watched or experienced or whatever it was I've done with Star Trek Picard Season 3, I found it quite astonishing what you accomplished. Especially considering what has come since 2017 with the release of the beginning of Discovery. And I understand they've wanted, because everybody wants to turn Star Trek in when you're a creator, turn it, put something of yourself into it. But you seemed more beholden to the Star Trek mythos more so than what you might have wanted to do personally, because obviously you have your own thing. You, you have what you wanted to do and you came up with a story, but it was, you took these characters and extrapolated. Like if I was ever in a position to work on Star Trek in a capacity to, I've never made a show. I've only documented it or whatever, but, but I would want to do what you did. And it was like reading a great Star Trek novel. Well, I, I, I appreciate that. I hope the world sees it the way you see it, or at least the majority. I think it's self-evident, though. I would be I would be willing to bet people are going to be like this. Oh yeah, really? What, what did you do? <laughs> and I I'm willing to bet 45 minutes into episode one, they're like, oh, okay, I'll watch the next episode. 
I'll bet. I I I I, I hope you're right. Again, you know, I think. Rob again, is this is. Tough. What'd you say, Dave? Rob is tough. Like, he won't <laughs> blow Rob, smoke Rob up is, anybody's Rob is, Yeah, oh, I know. Oh, I only blow smoke yeah, up people's well, asses I, that I, deserve it. I I I I appreciate it. Again, I, I'd like uh, the story. I don't think the story could have been told if uh, Michael and Akiva didn't tell the, the previous stories the way they were told. I, I, I think no one was going to just make season three. I think they would have loved to have been like, let's go back out there. Um, it wasn't It wasn't the thing. Um, I mean, Patrick had very strong, I mean, he's very, you know, he says in his interviews, he didn't want to just do a retread of Star Trek Next Generation. That's not to say season three is that. In fact, I loved what he said today was, he's like, it's not really a reunion. It It's all earned. And I think that that is important. It's not just like, hey, let's get back together and check up on the planet Tasha Yar died in and see what the lava monster, you know. But um, what's Armist doing now? What's Armist? What's he up to? He's um, still. But look, it, it's look. It's an honor to, to to have done it. It's an honor to again. I mean, just being doing this with Doug is is super meaningful to me. I mean, I, you know, I don't. I don't know if that art department knew how much that young PA looked up to all of those people. I have a, where is it? I think it's- Well, we knew we liked you. Look what I have here. You know what, I just realized I have it here. Let me see if I can get it out without causing. Um, this is, Mike Akuta made this for me. Nice. Um, it's the Enterprise A dedication plaque. He made it with, from the Paramount sign shop, which had done all that stuff. He didn't have to make that for that stupid PA. He did because he knew that was my ship. Yeah. Like, I loved it. Yeah, um, and he knew you, and he knew you had a heart. Um, and <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, look, I, I, I hope I, I hope I, I hope people like it. You know, I, I, uh, I'm really proud of the last two hours specifically. Um, now, now, forgive me, uh, you directed the last two hours, didn't you? I did. Yeah. So not only did you like you're you're so far again you're Wiley E Coyote you're even further I mean, out in the yeah, air yeah. than I thought you were. Yeah. No, I've got the, the anvils coming down on. Yeah, it's. <laughs> back me rocket. Back. I'm either gonna step to the left and it's gonna fall right or <laughs> um, pancake. So. Uh, no, I think uh, I think look you're you're gonna deal with a lot of shit, but you know what you're gonna you're gonna emerge victorious on the other end. Well. <laughs> I appreciate that. There's always going to be some shit. You can't, you know, there's always yeah. going to be some Well, listen, but, Terry, I know you have to go. Um, I do. But, Doug, uh, I'm going to keep you here. You keep Doug. Right. Well, I got to go at 830, though. So Okay, I got 20 more minutes. So I got, I'm got. i going to keep Doug. Doug, Doug, Doug is, knows way more and is, has better stories than I do. So <laughs> make sure you get them all out. I'm going to go say goodnight to my kid and then probably turn this on. Terry, it's good, so good to see you. Terry, I am good so happy you. that you came I on board. You, and uh, the, it was great to finally meet you at the Hollywood Bowl, man. And by the way, your kid, what a smart, what a smart, cool kid you have. He's, he's, he's pretty cool. He's pretty cool. Um, he's he was wearing, cool. it was funny because I asked him, he's wearing a shirt. I, I didn't realize that was merch from 2019. He's like, no, no, no. I, I saw John Williams in 2019. This is from the last time he played the Hollywood Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. You've done well, sir. Yeah, I, you know you got to raise them right. Support. It's true. Well, thanks, thanks for coming on for Star Trek Day. Much Thank appreciated. You. Happy Star Trek Day, both of you gentlemen, and uh, I'm sure we'll do this again soon. I hope so. Yes, we will. All right. I'm telling you, we should do an after show of every episode. Okay. Maybe <laughs> about that. You're probably gonna come at me for this. So. Um, all right. All right. Thanks Good for being here. Help. See you, Terry. All right. Well, that was a treat, oh, that Doug. Was great to send, to spend time with Terry like that. That's so listen, guy, wonderful. He's such a good guy, and it was so cool that he came on. Listen, I have to ask you. I want to bring up up something. I I hope I'm not overstepping, but um, you recently lost Dorothy, as I like to call her, Duder. Dorothy mm-hmm. Duder, your wife, who was one of the most spectacular people uh, I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. The first time I met her is you back when I was still married. My ex-wife threw me a, a surprise eyes wide shut birthday party, <laughs> and I you guys. You the pool, right? I went in the pool. I pulled off all my clothes and jumped in the pool. Dorothy was like, "Okay," <laughs> <laughs> but she, you know, she was the kind of gal 
who, you know, was wonderful and beautiful and elegant, but also irreverent and funny. And, you know, and she would love, she, and she loved that, you know. She was, I mean, as I was telling you earlier, uh, she had an elegance and a grace. It was like she was a, a woman out of time. And I'm sure the people who are watching who are, you know, want to see how I'm doing, you know. And is um, how are you it, doing? It's, I don't know, you know. It's been a couple of months now, but she, it, it really took place over like a 14 months. And um, I'm sure I've got post-traumatic stress syndrome, you know. Uh, she's the love of my life. Uh, I can't even explain how much I love her. Um, I miss her so much. Um, I'm sure I'll never recover from it. And why should I, you know, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm excited because, you know, I discovered, uh, that she had been working on a memoir, uh, which is so revealing and wonderful to have more Dorothy, mm. you know, when the thought there wasn't going to be any more. Um, and I plan to finish her memoir for her and probably combine it a little bit with, with, the things that have happened to me. I mean, it's a Hollywood love story. Yeah, it really is. By the way, there's my there's my Dorothy Dorothy Ruth Duder tattoo. That's a uh, signature. I love. I mean, I just love that her last name was Duder because immediately I'm like, she's the dude. She was amazing. Now, what's interesting to me is is you, of course, you won an Academy Award for doing character makeups in Warren Beatty's Dick Tracy. And if I remember you correctly, telling me. Didn't you meet her? Were you working on Dick Tracy when yeah, you first met her? Yeah, it wasn't for Warren Beatty, you know, and John Caglione. I have to, you know, I never would have met Dorothy. And um, <laughs> thank God, he, yeah, thank God, Warren Beatty didn't take her take her off your I, hands before you met her. I, God, <laughs> terrifying. Well, you know, I mean, it's like that was always my problem with with the girls was that. Um, especially when you're in full, when the hormones are firmly in the driver's seat, there's, there are some men who just have a certain combination of good looks and, uh, and charm, and you got to be at least six feet tall, uh, <laughs> and the girls can't resist them, you know. Um, Dorothy and I were best friends for two and a half years, and we never even thought of, you know, going out, although we got together all the time. Uh, and it was the perfect way to, to have a relationship because by the time we became involved with each other in that way, um, we knew each other so well. Right. I mean, we knew everything about each other. And I'm telling you that in 32 years, we never had an argument. You know, I mean, really, if you're going to be rational with people, you're not going to argue with them, you know, and then they're going to argue with you. You can discuss and talk about stuff. And you guys actually, you got to work together on Enterprise. She was the food, the food yeah. designer. Well, you know, the thing was that they had decided on Enterprise that they wanted to, you know, turbo lift was always used for plot exposition. You know? And they decided they want to get away from that. They decided to kind of do what Bonanza used to do, where there'd be a meal. Right. You know, in the captain's mess or whatever. And uh, Craig Binkley, who was the, the prop guy, uh, he had to find a food stylist, someone who can make food that looked good, but also they could eat for eight hours, you know, because it could take all day to shoot it. And I just remember poor Bink, he couldn't find anybody who could do the job. Uh, and I, I knew that Dorothy would be perfect for this. And I knew that if he had Dorothy, she'd rather die than let him down and let me down, you know. And I just waited till Bink was really desperate. <laughs> Then I went into his office and I said, Bink, blood is thicker than water. And boy, if I got the girl for you. <laughs> and um, he brought Dorothy in. And not only could she be there on time, do everything on budget, make it delicious so that the actors sometimes would blow their lines because they couldn't stop eating. I mean, I got video of it. It's hilarious. <laughs> they loved her on stage. And I guess if I can remember one of the grips said, you're Mrs. Doug? So adorable. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, she was, we hired her on Dick Tracy. I tell a story about how they put us at the Beverly Garland Hotel. And uh, I had gotten a recommendation from someone at Rick Baker's shop for Dorothy Duder. 
And uh, I called her and she said she was going to come down if, if we wanted to meet her. And I remember saying to John Gaglione, I said, she's going to come down. Do you want to meet her in the restaurant? And God bless John. <laughs> <laughs> he, he goes, uh, you know, we're in Hollywood. Tell her to meet us by the pool. <laughs> and I, I broke up laughing. I said, uh, meet us by the pool. And, you know, when I found her, I, I tell the story about how we're sitting by the pool and this woman comes in the gate to the pool and she is perfect. Her hair is perfect. Her makeup is perfect. Her, the way the way she walks is perfect. Everything. Her posture sits down and talks to us. And her outfit. I mean, it was, you know, <laughs> and um, we both liked her, you know, I mean, and also she's a very good looking woman, you know. Oh, she yes. Can't help it, you know. And uh, I just remember she gave us each a card. And uh, as she was leaving and perfectly walking her way out, I remember saying to John, I said, oh, come on, man. Forget it. She's too good for us. She belongs in a glass tower somewhere, not in <laughs> dirty makeup lab. And thank God, John said, no, let's give her let's give her a shot. And we did. And uh, she was like our pit bull, man. She handled everything. She went, you know, uh, after Dick Tracy and after we started going out and after we got married, I mean, she was like, that, you, first of all, you didn't mess with her, Doug, you know, and if <laughs> something needed to be done for Doug, she would make sure it got done. Nice. Nobody could get in her way. Living here was like living at a four, five-star resort. You know, every night was a fantastic meal. I'm back to standing up and eating like a sandwich over the sink in the kitchen. It's like, how did I come to this? You know, I miss her. You know, she's going to the moon. You know that, right? Yeah. The fans teamed up and raised the money for, the, you know, there's the space shot with Michelle and everybody else. But I didn't want her going into deep space. I wanted her to be, I wanted her to be dispersed on the moon because I want to know where she is. You know, she's right. Deep space. I don't know where yeah. the hell she is. Well, whenever but, you look up, though, there'll be a part of her on the moon. Yeah, and it will intrinsically change the meaning of the moon for me for the, forever. Yeah, you know, I love that. And I think of that song. You know, I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. You know, um, I have cried every day for the last two months. It, when you, I, unless you've really experienced grief, I mean, I didn't know that I hadn't experienced grief before. But this is like insane. You know. Um, I'm very excited about projects and things that I want to do, but then there's a part of me where it's like, God, life without Dorothy is hardly life, you know? Right. Uh, but, uh, my God, it was the most wonderful, you know, and I'm going to, I'm going to finish up her memoir. Uh, I mean, I have plans for two books that I want to do, uh, once I become retired. And one is an anecdotal about my life in Hollywood. All yeah. Things that, me. I mean, you were you you had you had experience working for Dick Smith. Oh yeah, like on the Hunger. Yeah, you know, Dick of, my first job. Yeah, one of the great uh, great. Uh, the I mean, Dick Smith did the Little Big Man. No one did old age makeups. What he did for Bowie Exorcist? on that movie, oh, Exorcist, yeah. incredible, incredible. Yeah. Well, listen, I know I've only got you for nine more minutes because I <laughs> eight eight thirty is our hard out. I'm early riser, and I wanted to talk about Dorothy, but I I do want to get your you know your thoughts on the Star Trek franchise i mean you you you're an you're an OT an original trekker you know you watched it when it was on and um, people don't know but you're you're a fanatic about the world's fair in the the you've got pieces from the world's fair in your backyard and the design work and and your love of star trek didn't would it be fair to say it propelled your interest and your career uh, as the the franchise and what it meant to you brought you to oh, where you are today? 200%. I mean, uh, I owe the direction of my life to Star Trek. Um, Star Trek was an eye-opener for me. Well, first of all, I was a, for a kid, and when Star Trek was originally on, I was like 12 and 13 years old. I was a really well-read kid. I read all the classics, and Renline, and Edgar Rice Burroughs, and, you know, I, I, I was a science fiction snob, you know. And most of the world, I still am. <laughs> well, most of the world at the time didn't thought science fiction was kid stuff. You know, they were very, very few science fiction. I mean, there's masterpieces like the Twilight Zone, 
the old outer limits. Yeah. There's goofy stuff that I still have nostalgia. I mean, we had you had Lost in Space with a Carrot Man. Yeah, you know the Great Vegetable Rebellion. The Great Vegetable you know, Rebellion. I think that was wasn't that Cyrano Jones who played the carrot. Yeah. I just remember I read an interview with uh, Jonathan Harris, and I spent a lot of time on the 20th Century Fox lot uh, because of Orville, which was a great thrill because that lot hasn't changed much, you know. And, you could you could see where everything was filled. One of our stages was where Fantastic Voyages was filmed. But um, <clears throat> Jonathan Harris said that he had just read the Great Vegetable Rebellion. <laughs> I don't know what it took him so long to go. This is crazy. And he ran into the unfortunately named Peter Packer, who was the writer of the Great Vegetable Rebellion. And Jonathan Harris says to him, "The Great Vegetable Rebellion." And Peter Packer says, I haven't another idea in my head. <laughs> you know. Well, it was original. God damn. I mean, I love it. I, uh, Irwin Allen, no matter what he did with the shows that were like nuts, he always brought in uh, some good art direction in the beginning, especially. Well, I mean, he if you look at look at the 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 like your your beautiful design for the sea view and the 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 flying sub and oh, the hey. spin the spin drift from oh, Village of oh. the Giants. Or yeah, Land of the Giants. I'm, I'm not a big Spindrift fan, but I the the uh, the Flying Sub is a masterpiece. And oh yeah, Sea View is a masterpiece. You know they were talking about rebooting it for a while there, and uh, the, the guys who were writing the script, uh, I think it was Lions. I don't know. Uh, uh, they were on my Facebook page and they saw I had models of the Sea View, you know, and and they asked me if I'd be willing to do some illustrations, and I did a half a dozen illustrations where I redesigned the sea view. It's still the sea view. It's comparable to the motion picture enterprise. It's still the ship. You know, it's just uh refined in some ways made more, you know. Oh uh, yeah, the the refit enterprise, the motion picture enterprise is my very favorite spaceship of all time. Well that was my guide when I was, you know, doing the next generation sea view. You know? And I I'm really I'm gonna you know Apparently, Disney is going to do 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea as a series, I had heard, and that kind of derailed. Whereas, in my opinion, if you're in a studio and you hear Disney's going to do 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, you say, okay, well, we're going to do Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea. That's how Voyage got made in the first place, right? 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Why would that be negative, you know? Uh, so I have, a, I have a feeling that that won't happen. And uh, I basically have permission from the uh, guys to release the images that I did uh, for the show. They're really some cool stuff. I'm really proud of it. By the way, uh, uh, Brian uh, O'Neill Singleton says, didn't the Proteus show up in TOS as the alternative factor with Lazarus? Well, that's not the Proteus. I can understand why people think it is. You mean that 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 thing with the dome on it? Yeah. <laughs> nothing the same. <laughs> Uh, yeah. Well, we and, do have a dome on the top of the Proteus. Yeah, but, but it's know. not. Yeah, and then the same. Uh, Brian also asks, "Did you ever collaborate with Eagle Moss's ship designs?" And you did Only because, the good ones. yeah, they, <laughs> <laughs> well, they made they made your uh, they made your refit uh, NX01. Well, the thing was that whenever they did something of mine, Ben Robinson <clears throat> made sure that I said, "Listen, I'll give you all the help you want, but you must pass it by me." right up to the, the the end and he was okay. he was great with that so i you know i they did a great job on the nx refit i you know what uh, look i mean i've i've got i love my eagle moss ships <laughs> i always have them i mean here's i think mike akuda actually made this from an original model kit to be on the set it's a nebula class he just took a galaxy class model and turned it upside down and and made this and then it got turned into the nebula class but this is one of their there, I I love Eagle Moss, and I hate. They've done tons and tons and tons of great stuff. There've been a few that were clinkers and clunkers, but there's always going to be that, you know. I, um, I heard that they were kind of running the ground. Well, yeah, they've gone they've gone like bankrupt. They're they're in receivership in England. So, wow. like, I what was buying. The, what's that? What a shame. Too bad. I mean, and I if there's, I mean, I really want to be honest. I really want Eagle Moss. I wish they were around to do, the the. I mean, I didn't talk about this when Terry was here, but there's there's another uh, uh, starship that 
the Titan encounters like they they meet up in space. Mm-hmm. And I don't remember. I don't know if it's an intrepid class, but it's really interesting. And it's got this really this sort of underslung. It's another Bill Krause. Oh yeah, it's another Bill Krause another ship. Bill Krause. I mean, basically what happened. It's was really cool Perry, though, and I want that. Perry liked those two designs, and so basically, um, I built approval models of those. Uh, Bill knows Star Trek technology inside and out. He yeah. hardly needs any help from me. But um, uh, Bill, uh, Dave Blast needed someone who could move fast. You know, uh, I mean, I think I did the approval model, the first pass on the approval model for that ship. Even the Titan was like a week. Yeah. You know? I mean, uh, I really enjoy, we didn't talk about it, but we he did mention that there is a an on-camera villain, you know, a, a new villain character that we talked about, that Terry talked about. But what we didn't talk about is that character has a badass ship. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, John and I, John Eves and I worked a lot on that. Uh, it's, it's badass, And I want all of these things. You know, I, I have yeah. not, I have not bought one discovery, uh, model, any ship models. I have not bought any of them. I have not, I even feel, uh, like I've betrayed a woman in my life because I do have the JJ prize model kit that they released. <laughs> I shouldn't have it. I feel like I've, I've betrayed somebody. Um, but, and I did not buy the Picard, the Van Halen ship you know it's i mean did nobody realize that that they painted picard that or or, uh uh, what's his face is you know rios's ship is painted like eddie van halen's guitar yeah i mean it's (laughs) it's probably done on purpose by somebody i'm sure it was done on purpose i really liked rios as the captain of the stargazer i'm sorry we didn't get to see more of him no it's i did too how to run a ship you know i mean i thought that he was really good yeah yeah but but listen, I know I want to let I'll let you go. But uh, first of all, I want to thank you very much for being on. But I still, if I could just get a little bit to end this Star Trek day, if you could talk a little bit about what the Star Trek franchise has meant to you over the years. Well, it's like massive, uh, massively important to me. Um, it was an epiphany uh, in so many ways. I mean, when I watched it, I knew that whoever was behind it really liked science fiction. Um, it, it rang true to me because I was a literate science fiction kid. Uh, and um, the making of Star Trek, which came out, I guess, in the second season. Stephen Whitfield's book. Holy crap. I mean, I'm I'm like 13 years old and I'm reading call sheets. Oh, yeah. Production memos. And I'm getting this big picture now. I mean, I had been getting slides from Lincoln Enterprises while the show was still on the air. Mm-hmm. And discovering shots where... There was a guy with a clapboard, you know, or you could see the camera boom. And realizing that, yeah, the show is phenomenal, but there's this other adventure, this other struggle going on just beyond the frame, you know, which is just as exciting even more than what the stories of the shows tell, you know. Um, I It was the first time I think I really realized that you could – I mean, I knew that people worked in Hollywood. I saw names on television shows right. and stuff. But the idea that these were real human beings, and I, I think it was the making of Star Trek that really gave me a good picture. Oh, you know? me me too. I mean, it was interesting because that book, and then, of course, when Star Wars came out, the making of Star Wars, that documentary, and and suddenly and with the rise of, of magazines, like well, when Cinefix came out in 1980, you know the and everything that followed in the wake of Star Wars, the blueprints and everything. You realize that this was something you could do, you could yeah. get in, involved in. Well, I had sort of gotten that idea from the World's Fair, which was '64 to '65. Mm. Uh, it was in Flushing Meadow, Spider-Man's hometown, and um, uh, it, it was at a time where it was only like 20 years after World War II. Uh, economically, the the United States was preeminent. Um, uh, the co- big corporations had lots of money to burn, and they would spend it on stuff like World's Fairs. And this was at a time where, like today, you could go on the Internet and see almost anything. Back then, to introduce people to new products and new ideas, there was television, but you'd have a World's Fair. Right. You, all these companies would put together these magnificent pavilions. I mean, General Motors, Futurama, 
The 64-65 World's Fair was very sci science fiction futuristic heavy. With this space program was just starting up, Project yeah. Mercury, you know. And um, if I told you that Walt Disney was going to build Disney World in Florida, but it's only for two years. In two years, he's taken the whole thing down. Oh, my God. Well, that's the World's Fair was bigger than that. Yeah. And it was only there for two years. And um, uh, it had such an impact on me. And I sort of realized someone's making this stuff. I remember when I started working with Mike, I said, you, you know that the World's Fair is like ground zero for the Star Trek design ethic. And I don't know that Mike really believed me or not. <laughs> but we went out to dinner with Matt Jeffries one night. And I said, Matt, did you go to the 64 World's Fair? And he goes, oh, yeah. He says, I mean, my wife and I went, Marianne, and we worked, we walked our feet off and we had a ball. And when I got back, he said, there was a message from a guy named Roddenberry. And I like kicked Mike under the table. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, have me back sometime to talk about the early days of Star Trek. We didn't get a chance to really do that. But no. that's such an interesting period of time, you know, and then... Federation Trading Post and well, that's we what I wanted to get into, you know, and and I do want to have you back and and uh, you know when Terry, I didn't think Terry would jump on today. Oh no, yeah, we had to let him go, man. I mean, that's that's to have him here and talking about that, you know. And and you know, I think you know it's funny because we did. I mean, we only met over Twitter, and there was animosity. I mean, I was just being <laughs> snarky, and he's he's also a sweet a sweet guy yeah, too. Yeah, he's a sweet, rational guy. And when know? he reached out to me, I mean, I think he reached out to me, and I was like, "Oh, that's the way to be." You know what I mean, so bad. I, Terry? You're an awesome guy. I mean, you know, I'm yeah. so happy to do this. And, yeah, and uh, he, I mean, I, I honestly believe it's so funny because people think, like, I didn't, I didn't know him, you know, and and. Um, what he, I think, what he's done is extraordinary. But like yeah. he pointed out, and like you pointed out, everybody has their own, their own Star Trek. But I have been my, my vehement hatred of modern Star Trek has been well documented. But it's not, you know, it's it's not. I, I somebody who works in the industry myself. I I appreciate the work that goes into everything. But what I what I find incredibly frustrating is that Star Trek is the most. If you're a creator. And I know a lot of people think that it hamstrings everybody to have so much canon. But all the work is is like done. So much of the work has already been done for you. So you don't have to worry about those things and you can concentrate. I mean, also, who complains about when they do Pearl Harbor that they have to stick to the facts? Right. right. Well, that's what I've never understood. Like uh, to me, to me, when you look at Star Trek, it happened. Like you can't yeah. you can't say it didn't That's happen, crazy. and then th someone throws at you and goes, "Well, you know, there's the United Earth Space Probe Agency, and then the Federation doesn't get mentioned to the second season," and I'm always like, "So, that doesn't mean the Federation wasn't there. They only those characters in that particular instance just mentioned the United Earth Space Probe Agency was a different division. <laughs> it didn't. It yeah. doesn't. You know, and you I, try and make heads or tails of it all. I, I totally understand." Uh, you know, people love knowing the show inside and out. That's part of the thrill of it. You know, and that was what made fandom, the fandom of Star Trek, because it seemed real. Like with like with Tolkien or like with Dune. You yeah. know, you can study what Frank Herbert was doing or Professor Tolkien was doing. And there's, they thought so much about the universe is it's all right there. And if yeah. you as a viewer... I think that's what people are, are, are most get most upset about is it's already been laid out here. And then when someone comes along and tries to change it, everyone's like, why are you doing that? Well, I mean, it's no more or less than what would happen if you gave, you did Pearl Harbor and you gave the Japanese F-15s because they're cooler. <laughs> you know, why not? They're cooler. And, and they sleeper. did that in the final countdown <laughs> when you the know. Nimitz goes back in time. I, you know, I really enjoy that movie. I love that movie. <laughs> and it's and, got and a great John like Scott Douglas. score. Oh, yeah. I mean, it really, it's such a, it's such a fun movie. Kirk Douglas is awesome as the skipper. He's so good. And, Splash yeah. the zeros. Yeah. Oh my God. And the music, the score is really so good. good. Well, listen, I know. Oh, it's so good. Dun 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 dun. So good. Uh, that's so good. That score is so good. Um, and it's on 4K Blu-ray. 
Uh, oh, the is? movie is, yeah. Yeah, they, they released on four. Well, listen, Doug, I, I've kept you over time. I just, it was great to have you here. It was so great to see you and Terry reconnect yeah, and all that from working on, oh, on Spending Picard. time with Terry was, you know, fantastic. And uh, I mean, we are really proud of that guy. You know? Oh, I mean, yeah. He had heart back then and he still does, you know, and he's, he's, a, he's a really rare person. And, uh, and listen, it's because of Terry. Of course, Bill Blast, uh, Dave Blast, Bill Blast. Dave Blass is a real geek. He's a real geek. If there was somebody who had been the showrunner who was more offended by what came before and thinks that it was crap, Bill uh, Dave couldn't have he couldn't have had us probably. <laughs> Very right. supported that, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think when people see when it all comes together, um they're gonna love it. Yeah, I can't wait. I can't wait. February can't come soon enough. Well, listen, but anyway, sir. Let me say, first of all, to my, to Dorothy, I love you. Uh, I cannot, I hardly have the words. I, I love you, my darling. And, you know, I'll be looking at the moon, but I'll be seeing you. And thank you, everyone who, who chipped in also uh, to get that moonshot for her. Oh, yeah. To, Which know. is amazing. Archer fandom, man. Phew. Amazing. It's a powerful force when it's well harnessed. Yeah. Less than 24 hours, they raised the money for her mission. That's incredible. Anyway, I'm up at 3 in the morning, so i got to get going. All right, Doug, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for being here on Star Trek Day, and we'll have you back because I want to hear your entire Star Trek journey. And I love talking about it, so. All right. Thanks for being here, man. Live long and prosper. Well, everyone, that was Mr. Doug Drexler and Terry Metalis. What an amazing, I mean, this went better than I thought. Now, I am not going to read letters. I'm going to, I'm just going to leave the show here. Um, There's a few more uh, uh, little super chats. Julian Mushkin, who is a longtime uh, channel member, says, I have to say that the teaser for Star Trek Picard today actually evoked an emotional response. I thought, where did that tear come from? And uh, he's not wrong. And I'll, I'll flat out say it. I mean, there's emotional stuff in Star Trek Picard that is, if you're a longtime Star Trek fan, there there's a lot. There's many moments um, where you will be taken aback by how emotional that you will feel. And it'll creep up on you. You won't, you won't even realize it. You'll be shedding a tear and you won't even know. A minute ago, you won't have been shedding a tear, but you will. I promise you, you come back and you tell me I'm wrong. February 16th is when Star Trek Picard Season 3 drops. It is 10 episodes, and they're not like Marvel shows. It's not like 34 minutes. They're chonky. I mean, you get your hour's worth. So, um, yeah. And, uh, man, I just wish Eagle Moss was here because there's a lot of shit I want to buy. I even had this idea. I was going to call up Ben and uh, be like, bro, I got this idea. There's this thing. How can I how can I say this? Only Eagle Moss could have done, done it. But um there's just let's just say that there is a thing that I would love to have seen Eagle Moss made, but it would be a thing that you would add to, kind of the way Hallmark makes Christmas ornaments. I wanted Eagle Moss to do let's call it a, a tree. <laughs> a tree with ornaments on it. But Eagle Moss style. I'll just I'll just say that and leave it there. Because, um, yeah, you'll see. You'll know what I mean (laughs) when when you see it. Uh, Jeff Bingham says, I get that my screenplay isn't entirely original by sharing a premise with the movie Bound, but I'd have to imagine that unless it's their own autobiography, a first-time screenwriter would write what they like and do their own take on something familiar, correct? Well, Jeff, uh, I'm sure Tara would say yes, probably too. Um, And uh, that's... um, that's um yeah i think you're right i mean there's no reason why you can't write a riff on something that's come before lots of things are like that so i i'm i'm sure that um that would be fine and uh our friend captain robert april says i want in on that early days of trek talk that could be fun uh mr captain robert april how are you hope all is well with you and your lady um yeah Maybe so. I I haven't scheduled anything. Um, this was just it was this was such a treat 
for Star Trek Day. I mean, uh, let's face it, it is Star Trek Day. It is the 56th birthday of Star Trek. And um, I was very happy that Doug Drexler and Terry Metalis came on to this show. And I thought we had a great conversation. I hope you liked it. I mean, there's going to be a lot more of that on this channel. I know I've slacked off uh, in 2022. Um, and I've only been doing shows on the weekends, but I'm going to do more of Rob's observation shows and bring them back because there's a lot to discuss. And for those of you who might have come in late, here's some looks at, this is from the trailer they dropped today. These are shots of the Titan A, the Titan refit. Um, and I, I'm actually, that Bill Krause... Uh, as Terry told you, I think it was the Shangri-La that it was Bill Krause's original design. And, um, here it is. I mean, I, I, I enjoy this ship. I think it's, uh, I think it's very cool. And let me tell you, it looks sexy on screen. Although, poor ship, you know, it's, uh, it's, it like, let's just say it gets bullied gets bullied in this day and age. You don't want people to get bullied or starships to get bullied, but the Titan, um, you know, not like the Defiant got bullied in first contact. Not like that. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, it's good stuff. But anyway, I'm going to end this special uh, episode of Rob Observations. I want to thank my esteemed guests, Doug Drexler and Terry Metalis, for coming on the show. I want to thank all of you for supporting this channel via Super Chats and Tips. And I want to thank my moderators, Tom Jr. Jackson, Brian Hepburn. Uh, I think uh, Louise X. Sparrow was here earlier. Justin Toner, Darren Seeley. We have a full complement of moderators. I want to thank you both. Thank you both. Thank you all for coming on the show. And for all the people that I don't know about... We're going to have a member call this weekend. It might be on Sunday because I'm going to D23, it looks like. So if you're a member of the channel, we are going to have a membership call maybe this week. But if not this week, then for sure next week. And then on that note, I would say this. Remember, every person you meet has a story to tell that you have yet to hear. And all you have to do is listen. And with that, I would say to all of you, live long and prosper, peace and long life, survive and succeed, uh, you know, be like Elborn. And um, hey, this week was a big week. We got Star Trek, the director's, Star Trek, the motion picture director's cut. We got Star Trek's two, three, four, five, and six on 4K Blu-ray, and uh, they all look excellent, so that's very exciting. So it was a big week for Star Trek. Um, kudos to CBS Home Entertainment for releasing all of those discs this week. Kudos to them. And thanks to everybody um, that made Star Trek Day a great success over at uh, the Skirball Cultural Center today. That was pretty neat. And on that note, I would say to all of you, have a better night.